Thank you everybody for joining us today. I'm really excited to welcome our Lieutenant Governor, Cyrus Habib. As Lieutenant Governor, he presides over the State Senate and he serves as acting governor when the governor is out of town. And he's passionate about several issues, including veterans and disability employment, economic development, access to higher education, trade and international relations. Um, prior to being elected as Lieutenant Governor, he served on both the State Senate and the State House of Representatives, and he has a degree from a law degree from Yale Law School. And he's done all of this while overcoming many obstacles. He's a self-described three-time cancer survivor, blind uh, Iranian American from a mixed religion immigrant family. So really excited to have him here today. Thank you so much for visiting us. I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Well, it's wonderful to be here. Um, part of uh, what I guess didn't make its way into my bio is that I'm also a, um, a former Googler, um, although only briefly. I was a, um, a I, I never made it out of my Noogler phase. I was an intern in the London office of Google, a sales intern, um, the summer between my first and second years in law school, uh, working on Middle Eastern and North African uh, sales. So, um, so I do. I have I have a, a ton of kind of uh, first decade Google swag um, to show for it. And um, and actually, it was exactly ten years ago this year. So, um, uh, it's wonderful to be here with you guys uh, to talk about accessibility. Um, you know, I want to give you a bit of framing around. Um, why I'm, I'm personally passionate about this issue, why I care about it, why I'm grateful to you all for caring about it. Um, as you heard, um, I uh, uh, am the son of immigrants from Iran. My parents came here um, in search of economic and educational opportunities. Uh, shortly after I was born, I was diagnosed with a rare childhood eye cancer that uh, took my eyesight and my left eye as a newborn and then came back again uh, and left me completely blind at age eight years old. And I, I often joke that because that happened in 1989, that's when I was eight years old. So all eight years that I could see actually took place within the 1980s. <laughs> so all my visual memories are still from the 80s. So everyone still looks like Cindy Lauper and Boy George. <laughs> um, we moved from Maryland, where I'd grown up to that point, to Washington State. And um, thanks to a, a combination of uh, parents who really believed in me and believed in my ability to fulfill my own potential, um, as well as um, relatively well-resourced public schools here on the east side of King County, um, and some extraordinary teachers who had a big effect in my life. And as you'll hear in a moment, thanks also to some technologies, um, uh, I was able to, and of course, thanks to meaningful public policy uh, and laws, uh, I was able to travel the road from Braille to Yale um, and, and beyond. And um, so when I think about technology, uh, I mean, I had the, the great pleasure of representing this district in the state legislature. So in addition to this campus, I also represented Microsoft's headquarters. Um, you know, I, I um, could, could around the world say I may just be a state legislator, but what state legislator, what other person who's a state legislator could ever say that they represent the two wealthiest people on the planet. Um, but more than the two of them, um, it was and continues to be of particular interest uh, and, and uh, privilege for me to be able to represent the future Bezos and Gateses, uh, the future Pages and Brins, and, and, and the, the, essentially the entrepreneurs and innovators of the future who may not be famous yet, and uh, certainly may be in this room right now, um, that's really what is exciting to me. Um, and, and I'll tell you why technology has always been, because I, I, even before I was a legislator, I practiced law at Perkins Coie um, in Seattle, and uh, where I represented startups and helped technology companies with licensing issues and, um, and other early stage uh, corporate matters. 
the reason it's always been of interest to me is that um, when you have a disability, you have got, you've got this kind of special relationship with technology, which is that um, you're in a kind of a, a ever iterating cycle of being disrupted by technology um, and then having technology then come to the rescue. Um, and to some degree, I mean, that's not unlike our general condition as, as, as a human race, but it's particularly pronounced for people with disabilities. So to take the, um, the IT or ICT context, um, so when I was a kid, I, was, I wasn't like the nerdiest kid. Like, there are definitely nerdier people in the room right now. Um, but like, I wasn't that, but like, I was into computers. And... Um, and so, and you know, growing up in this area, like a lot of my friends were kids of Microsofties and stuff. So like I grew up around computers. So, um, so what I first did was, uh, I remember the first computer I had uh, was a 486 and running DOS primarily. And if you're blind, DOS was like the, the golden age, right? Like command line interface, just, so easy, right? So, because you know, there's screen reading software, and so like it's great. You can copy files. You can find out what's in the directory that you're in. You can move around to different directories. And for for I mean, I think you all knew, but directory is what we called folders before they were folders. <laughs> right? um, you know, and so like you could do all kinds of like you know things that that seemed impressive at the time, and then. Windows 3.1 and Windows 95 came out. And I was just starting high school. And that wasn't so good for people who were blind. Because, because you know, graphical user interfaces, you know, kind of by, by, you know, definition, were not made for blind people, like first and foremost. So, so there was this whole kind of like setback and disruption where like, you know, I could still use DOS, but like nothing interesting was happening in DOS anymore. No one was making applications for DOS. So I got pretty frustrated. I was like, you know, I loved command line interfaces. So I was like, you know what? My friend taught me about Linux. And I was like, I'm going to learn how to use Linux. Well, the problem with Linux was that there was no real screen reader for Linux. Like there were some weird solutions that people had, but like there was no... Op there was no screen reader that just ran on top of the operating system. So what I devised with a friend was this kind of like dummy terminal, right? This DOS, running DOS, okay, terminal that was like a, like I think it was like a 386. Like it had no power. And all it had was just telecommunications software that could, could that would, um, you know, run the, the serial drivers for the serial port, and it, there was a serial cable connecting that dummy terminal to a much more powerful Pentium PC that was running Linux. So that I could effectively do everything that anyone else could do on Linux, which was, you know, powerful, but command line, text-based, uh, at least at that time, um, and still can, can largely be operated text-based way, um, operating system. So I did that for like a bunch of years, like all the way through college. I, had, I was this weird guy who had two computers, you know, connected with a serial cable, only one monitor, you know, and, and it was like this whole thing. And then I finally, like, it got to a point where I was going to go interview for, for an internship. And they were like, look, this was in grad school. I was going to go work at a private equity fund. Uh, it, was, it was like a job while I was in grad school. It was more than an internship. And they said, look, like, like we, don't, we can't work with you like that. Like, you need to be able to, you know, create Excel spreadsheets. Like, you need to be able to do all this stuff. So, um, so I said, okay, well, then I'm going to have to learn how to use Windows after all. And, you know, like, by that point, it was like Windows 2000, or maybe it was almost, it was maybe almost Windows XP. So it was like, I, I went and learned how to use JAWS for Windows, which is the software that, to, that I still somewhat use today. I use it all the time when I'm using a PC. Um, and so kind of had to learn that and get, you know, and I felt pretty disrupted there, but I, you know, kind of uh, learned it. And right as I was feeling pretty good about P 
PC solutions. I had a laptop and I was like, I was like, I remember I started in law school in 2006 and I was like on the Metro North from Yale to New York and I was like using a laptop with like a, one of those like portable modem things in it, like, you know, and, and using earphones and it was great, it was using Windows. Then all of a sudden, what happened? The smartphone with the touch screen. Ooh, not good, right? <laughs> not good. Not good for the blind, right? And so, so I shied away from using that. And I mean, I use all the way until a guy who's here today who helped put this on, Mike Mello, taught me in, I remember it was Halloween of 20... 10 or 2011. Um, I just remember that it was Halloween because I was, I was going to a Halloween party. That he came and basically showed me how to use voiceover software on the iPhone, which has just been incorporated in, into the most recent um, iOS upgrade and in, into the iPhone. And so, um, and then what happened was I went from having been divided from my peers by this technology to not only catching up, but the iPhone, I've said this, and, and now, and I, I will now include Android devices, but it was, it was the iPhone that, that brought the solution first. Um, for me, was the greatest um, civil rights innovation since the Americans with Disabilities Act for the blind. Like, it, it, nothing has changed my life more that other than public policy, um, wh when it comes to you know overcoming this disability, than the iPhone, than having access to a smartphone, not only because it allowed me to do things you know which we're all now able to do in, in these in this decade since um, the iPhone and its competitors really came out, but you know and, and do them and be more efficient the way all of you are, but also because so many solutions that, that disproportionately help the blind. Like, can you think of one? Like, what's, what's one thing that, like, for the time being, blind people find it really difficult to do? Drive cars, Drive cars right? So, like, it was, so, so if you were lucky enough to be able to afford a taxi, and I was a corporate lawyer, so I could, then you had, if you were blind, the distinct, you know, pleasure of having to wait 20 minutes for a taxi to come and hope that the cab driver would be able to, you know, first of all, actually make it to you. And then you couldn't communicate with them, so you'd have to hope that they would just, like, figure out who you are, right? But most likely, they would pick someone else up on, on the way or think it's someone else or whatever, someone hails them down, and then you got to call again on your, like, regular phone, right? Like, and, and so it was like a total nightmare. If you were taking the bus, it was even worse. Right, because like, but, you know, if you didn't have access to, so, so now we have Uber, but if you, if, if you were taking the bus, you didn't have access to like one bus away or any of the other apps. And so you were really kind of set adrift in so many ways, disproportionately. And so whether it's wayfinding technologies, and I know that with the impact grants that Google has been given, I know that's an area where um, I think, you know, Google Maps and others have, are, are working together on, uh, on wayfinding solutions for the blind. By the way, I mean, I I'm talking about blindness because that's what I know about. Obviously, disability and accessibility is a much bigger topic, but you can extrapolate, right? So, so then the smartphone kind of became, um, you know, became the thing and, 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 and allowed me not only to catch up, but also actually disproportionately to benefit, I would say, compared to the, to the, to the um, standard population to the typical population, I'm really excited that the most recent user interface innovation that came about, like, essentially seems to have been developed by blind people. Because it's like a, just like a random, like, cylinder with no screen that you just talk to, <laughs> right? So I'm, of course, talking about the Google Home, not any of our other hometown competitors. Um, but like, you know, but, I, but I, it did, I, did, I did, of course, take note earlier this year when Amazon came out with like the Echo, Look, Show, whatever, I can't, names are, there's a few of them. But, you know, with a screen on it. 
And I was like, all right, so, so this will happen again. But it's OK, because the, um, the, the, in, in large part because of the interest and, and, and knowledge and skills of the people in this room and your uh, counterparts at Microsoft, Amazon, and Apple, I always give special recognition to Apple because, because of, this has been part of their culture from day one. Um, because of you and your counterparts, the, um, the lag time between the disruption and the rescue is actually sh has shrunk. Um, but here's what I think is more interesting than all of that. OK, so that's, I mean, and, and I, well, before I do that, let me say, I mean, the implications of this are huge because it's not just that I get to you know, know when the bus is coming or, or call an Uber or, or whatever um, or find my way around, but the implications for employment for people with disabilities are, are massive. For one thing, I mean, like one bus away helps people with disabilities to get to work, just like it helps everybody to get to work, disproportionately helps people with disabilities to get to work, which is an important part of working, right? Is actually getting to and from the job. Um, the ability to use um, a smartphone, uh, tablets, and other mobile platforms allows people with disabilities uh, to graduate from entry-level jobs to more sophisticated jobs. Um, but overall, as you know, I mean, I, I, it's my great privilege as a lieutenant governor to travel around the state and even the country and brag about this region. And what I say is that, like, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, all three have your cloud computing and much of your other fourth industrial revolution technologies, big data, AI, machine learning, um, Internet of Things, you know, have a lot of these operations headquartered here. Amazon and Microsoft, obviously, but even Google um, is, is growing uh, your, your cloud-based uh, operations here uh, in the Pacific Northwest. Well, why is that important to this discussion? Because as you create the solutions that your customers uh, are, are using, and cr that they're, they're creating, and then other customers are using, um, uh, the, you have the ability to make not only services, not only software, but entire platforms, entire systems accessible out of the box, which is going to have such a huge impact on the ability of people to find employment, the ability of people of all abilities to, um, to be able to uh, live uh, the quality of life that we all deserve. Um, but, but, but I want to go beyond all that, which is to say, that's all about um, accommodating. That's all about accommodating people with disabilities. And it's the right thing to do. In a lot of cases, when we get it right, it's the law. Um, you know, you all, I mean, Congress passed the CVAA, the 21st Century Communications Video Accessibility Act, in 2010 um, to, to, to lead, uh, to add on to the ADA in the, in the space in which I imagine many of you work, which is the communication space. So there are, there are, there are statutes, there are regulations, and, and those are good when it comes to um, to accommodating. But I actually think that what's more important for us to get the significance of this evangelized throughout organizations as large as Google is to talk about the upside business proposition. Now, in part, that's the you know one in five people with disabilities in this country who you also you know you don't want to write out as part of your customer base. But let me tell you something that I said to Microsoft folks, much like you guys, and I just wanted to be provocative. And, and you know, Microsoft's, this is more of a salient point to Microsoft than it is to Google, but I think it applies to some degree to, to, uh, to a number of companies. So what I said to them was I said, look, um, do, do you believe that the Siri technology the technology behind Siri, um, do you believe that like that was not doable before Siri, like five years earlier? Do you believe that like, you know, the technology behind Alexa and the, the Amazon Echo and other products and now Google Home, you know, do, do you believe that the, that the, that was not, it couldn't have been done? 
that like everyone was on the same page that this is something we need to do, but they just like never got around, or couldn't get the technology together. And I said, you know what I, I believe is that the speech recognition software, and you know, I got a chance to meet Ray Kurzweil, who's a hero of mine just a few weeks ago in New York. It's like speech recognition software was like for people with disabilities primarily. Um, having user out, you know, having output like Siri and Alexa and Google Home do, like that was for people with disabilities because everyone else could read the screen. So it'd be weird. Like, why would you have this thing talk to you? It didn't make any sense. You can read the screen, right? That's how everyone was thinking. Problem is that, like, when we think about how to be innovative, the hardest thing is to try to think outside our own box. This has been something Microsoft's particularly struggled with. But I will say, as Google becomes more and more of a legacy company, it's something Google's got to think about, too, is, you know, you get comfortable, you got some good products, you know, you, you, you're, you're cash rich, you know, you're, you're, you know, acquisitory in some good ways, you make partnerships. But, you know, you, you know, the paradigms get set in stone. Like, it's probably, I mean, I don't know, but I imagine it's probably quite, it'd be quite challenging to come and try to, like, do search in a completely different way at a company like Google. Because the search has been, you know, and the, and the, and the you know, the ad, ecosystem that lies on top of it's been such a critical part of Google's success and it's like Google's you know cash cow the ad business so uh, my belief is that but you know but let me say this but when you when you think about someone with a disability and how they do things you are automatically as soon as you do that you are in a different space you are already in a creative space you're already in an innovative space because you got to think completely differently. You've got you to completely disrupt your own assumptions about the best way to display information or the best way to take in a request. So what I told them was, look, I bet you, Microsoft, if you guys had actually said back when Windows 95 came out, let's figure out the best and most logical way for people who are blind to use Windows. Not just like, let's get some third party developer to, you know, we'll share the libraries with them. Like, we'll have them develop something so that, like, you know, you can kind of like, a blind person's gonna limp along on top of Windows and like try to approximate, but like actually tear it all up and say, how would we do this? Yeah, it's expensive. It's more expensive to do it that way. Even if, like, it's legal and you won't get sued, but like, it's expensive to do it that way. You might think there's not that many blind people. So I get why you may not wanna do that. From a, from a short-term economic perspective. But I told him, I bet you if you did that, you would have beaten Apple to the market on Siri. And I bet you if you did that, you would have beaten a Amazon to the market on Alexa. You know how hard it is for people at Microsoft to hear those kind of words? I mean, I, these people get to elect or unelect me, right? So it's not an easy thing to say to everybody. But it's, I truly believe, and you all can correct me, but I truly believe that when you wait, when you kind of, when you wait for innovations to happen by serendipity, it will take longer than if you follow what I believe to be a sure-proof way of developing new innovative solutions, which is think about whatever you're doing now and then think about how people of all different abilities or, or, or disabilities would want to accomplish the same task. The minute you do that, you will be creative. And you know it will have all types of unforeseen positive consequences. You know, people often talk about the curb cut effect. The people made wheelchair ramps for people in wheelchairs. But that if we didn't need wheelchairs anymore, we wouldn't get rid of curb cuts because everyone in this room has used them for one purpose or another, stroller, suitcase, whatever. So that effect is true, but it is, I think, particularly true if the business that you're in is competitive and the fault lines of competition are around innovation and imagination. So thinking about people with abilities and disabilities, not just the right thing to do for the, the market share that you will gain in users, but the right thing to do if you want to come out with the next game-changing innovation for everybody. And I promise you that there are innovations out there right now that if you all were thinking about how to make your products and services more available to the deaf, to people with cerebral palsy, to people with 
dementia maybe. I mean, I'm serious. If you start thinking about it, I bet you you're going to learn new things about memory, new things about kinetic technologies, and how the Internet of Things can, can move to the next level. So that's what I want to share with you all is, is my personal story of how technology has both disrupted and rescued me over time, how it's done that in the wider society, and the particular, not responsibility, because that's so boring and nanny state-ish, but actual economic opportunity for everyone here and everyone at Google, from Larry Page on down, to make money and create new innovations by thinking not about those with disabilities as an afterthought, but having that be a core part of a multi-ability approach towards product design and development. So with that, I will uh, end uh, my kind of mansplaining or politician politician-splaining uh, remarks, telling you how to do your job, and um, happy to answer any questions that you guys have. Thanks for the talk. Um, I, so I used to work in a government contractor, and this was back when the Section 508 of the ADA was yep. first. Um, Rehabilitations uh, Act. Right, right. Yeah. And uh, the so uh, one one of the core tenets of that is that we uh, all government uh, procured software had to have um, compliance with um, with the Rehabilitation Act, and and uh, there was a lot of effort put in at the time uh, to bring systems uh, to, to that level of compliance. And I remember using uh, JAWS uh, screen reader myself to, to go through and test the application to make sure that it was working uh, and, and usable um, with uh, only the audio interface. And I was wondering, um, over the past decade, uh, what, uh, what has the landscape, um, uh, how's the landscape changed both in terms of government procured software and uh, the private industry for s smaller companies in uh, making their applications um, uh, 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 accessible and usable. Yeah, I mean, it's it, you know that that's why I mentioned you know um, mobile, because I mean mobile is is so much a part of how we all um, uh, you know do, do our our computing and I mean uh, our communications et cetera. And so um, you know iPhone, I mean, iOS, Android, um, you know, the, the, you know, increasingly Windows, um, you know, to the extent these technologies have become accessible kind of natively, um, you know, uh, it's, it's made it all better. I mean, you know, I, I don't, you know, it, it, I'm sure it is the case, I'm, I know it's the case that like, you know, app developers, you know, have to think about and get input um, from the community, but it's it's so much easier when I, you know when the 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 operating system developers uh, have themselves already thought about um, you know how applications on this platform are going to interact with this um, with with this accessibility solution, right? So so for those who don't know, like I mean I don't know how it works with Android. I, I'm, I hate to say it. And, and, iPhone user, but like for the iPhone, for example, the way it works is like, you know, when you, you, you know, you touch the screen and rather than, than selecting that item, um, it reads you that item and then you would, you know, double tap on it to actually select it. Um, so, you know, kind of in, in that sense, kind of analogous to, um, you know, to, to a graphical user interface with a mouse. Um, and you know, and then there's some other you know reconfigured keystrokes uh, or you know keystro you know uh, j hand gestures that um, that Apple itself, uh, which is constantly in communication with the with the community, and I'm sure Google is. I've heard I've heard great things about Android too, um, you know, and and you know, and so that just alleviates the the um, all the you know most of the pressure on developers. There's still um, there's still issues, right? And I mean, sometimes it's 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 really kind of Things you know, you think, for example, like you know, captcha challenges and things like that. I mean, sometimes it's, it's very simple things like that, um, um, and uh, sometimes, and then websites, um, you know, the, the display of information on websites when they're when they're embedded in graphics and things. I mean, there's still issues that, um, that the operating system can't necessarily address or the web browser can't necessarily address, but they've gotten so much better at doing it. Um, uh, you know, even you know, recognition and, and you know, photo descriptions and things like that. 
um, is great. You know, government procurement, um, you know, I mean, I think, uh, I, I will say, I, I, think, I think government does the best job that, that it can, but it's not like there are a ton of options for most solution set, right? Like, so, so usually, I mean, you know, you, you need an enterprise solution, and here are your choices, right? And, um, and so that's why working with the, you know, the, these big four companies is so important. So um, I have two questions for you. I guess the line is okay. So I'll ask you my two questions. Um, like first question is, um, if you don't speak English, do you think your life would have been much worse? Um, for example, if I think of health bills, for example, they always have a page that have like a billion languages on it saying like, here's your right, like we can provide an interpreter for you to have your own language so that you can understand the bill, but that's all printed. And so if you're blind, I don't know what happens there. So that's my first question is, is if English, if you don't speak English, how your life would have been affected. And um, but do you mean, sorry, how my life would be with respect to technology or yeah. with respect to in general? But if I didn't can, speak English? Right. But if you want, you can also, particularly in technology, okay. that's what you want. Yeah. Do I get to speak another language, or do I just lose English? Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's say you do speak another language. OK. OK, what's your second question? And uh, my second question was, uh, is, um, do you ever use like cheat sheet or crypt sheet when you give public talk? or? similar assistive, assistive thing to help you with remembering what you're going to talk about. Um, is, is that your way of saying that my remarks were scattered and disorganized? <laughs> That's OK. <laughs> it's more like I, I didn't know. But can we, can, what about a hybrid question where it's like, what if you don't speak English and you need a cheat sheet for your speech? <laughs> yeah, That's a, sure. I think that, that again, smaller concentric circle, but still would be a cool technology for you guys to develop. Um, I, I think when, when it comes to, look, I, I don't know enough about being, um, I, I got the chance to visit a school for the blind in Seoul, South Korea, which was really cool um, a couple months ago, and, um, and, and talk to those students. But I don't know enough about um, how the, um, you know, the, the solutions that are out there, the accessibility solutions that are out there um, vary uh, from, from place to place. I mean, I do know that, like, you know, that there is Braille uh, in all different languages. I mean, we should not forget that Braille wasn't developed by an English speaker. So, um, you know, th th that does exist. And so where there's Braille, there's the ability to, you know, to do Braille printing. And I, I know that there are um, screen readers uh, in, in, in a number of different languages. Um, for a whole bunch of geopolitical reasons, um, Farsi, which is you know the language that my my parents first spoke, um, is is probably um, going to be one of the, the tougher ones for a population that large, um, for you know for for a bunch of reasons um, having to do with trade sanctions. But um, you know, I, there's no doubt that um, you know even if it were just living in the U.S. but in a rural area. I would have more challenges. Um, I mean, I, I feel very lucky to have grown up um, in an environment that's just, you know, I mean, I grew up just a couple miles from Bill Gates' home. So clearly, um, when new innovations would come out, um, you know, we had the wherewithal and the, and the knowledge and awareness of it to, to do it. And, and clearly, um, you know, Google, um, and I mean, I, I, this is like, it's, it's interesting because I did spend, you know, a couple months working on Middle East sales for Google. I mean, I know that growing overseas is huge, but obviously um, you guys and everyone, you know, test your products out in English first, those solutions come to market first in English. So um, that's definitely a big, um, you know, advantage um, for, for all of us. Uh, but, you know, increasingly, you know, you have, um, you know, major tech disruptors out there and, and tech companies, Tencent and Alibaba and others. And so, you know, there'll be, there'll be new solutions that will originate from those places and those companies. So um, I don't um, have any kind of a cheat sheet. I could have things brailled for me and have them with me or have a braille display. By the way, um, 
just so you guys know, one of the things I do as lieutenant governor is I serve as president of the state senate. So um, I preside over the state senate. And I call part of that job is calling on senators when they want to speak, and because they are politicians, they always want to speak. Um, and uh, so we had to figure out, okay, how do we make that happen? Because you know, when people stand up, how am I going to know who wants to speak? Well, we um, developed a solution that um, that where state senators have a touch screen on their desk and they when they want to speak they stand up and touch the screen on their desk and it sends their name up to a PC that's operating right up where I am in the front of the Senate chamber and then it sends their name onto a braille display in real time so I can call on senators as they speak so if you guys come to Olympia would love to show it to you and if you're um, uh, struggling with amnesia and you watch TVW channel 23 at night, you can see me presiding over the state senate <laughs> uh, and putting that technology to you. So I do sometimes use technologies in, in those kind of situations. Um, you know, or up there I do have braille so that I know which bills that we're doing, which legislation we're considering. But, um, but I don't for speeches, be, and I probably wouldn't if I could see, because I, I just think it's better to speak naturally to you guys and, and have a conversational approach, even if it's a big speech. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Oh yeah, there's a line now. All right. <laughs> so first of all, thank you so yeah. much for taking the time to come and address yeah. us this afternoon. My pleasure. Uh, I'm speaking to you as the very proud mother of two boys on, the, um, on IEPs who yeah. have developmental disabilities. Yeah. And as you yourself experienced, uh, technology is such an amazing difference when it comes to their ability to access the general education curriculum and to be included in gen ed. And yet, because of funding and inadequate funding growth, especially as things like autism have exploded, there just there has not been sufficient funding to be able to give them that kind of an opportunity so that they can also go to Yale. So what is being done in Olympia to address that in the short term? It's a, it's, it's a, uh, to my mind, um, you know, because I had the benefit of a 24-hour-a-day um, pro bono attorney as a kid. That's my mom, like you, um, fierce advocate um, for her son. And um, I, that, a question that you asked is, is the one that... Um, both motivates me and, and disturbs and haunts me, which is, um, you know, it's not just, I mean, notice that when I, I don't know if you were here when I first started out, but that I said, I said first parents, second, a reasonably well-funded uh, public school district. And it's absolutely critical. Um, it's why smaller class sizes are important. It's why, um, you know, f funding um, um, all day kindergarten is important. It's, it's so the larger education spending that we do is um, disproportionately helps kids with disabilities. But uh, over and above that, um, the underfunding of special education, uh, to my mind, m is means that we're we're not qu we're not there yet when it comes to our constitutional duty in this state for basic education. Um, we're not there yet on our statutory responsibilities under the IDEA and state laws. Um, and so I, you know, I think parents uh, should 100%, first of all, I mean, legislators should do the right thing in the first place, but, you know, sometimes litigation is a part of that and, and lawsuits have happened and they'll continue to happen. And I think um, that's an important part of the system because kids need to, you know, the stories of kids who um, were not getting access to the kind of assistance that they need, the support they need uh, to be able to fulfill their full potential, um, those stories need to, to get heard, and um, in, in, if they're not heard in legislative offices, they need to be heard in courtrooms. Um, and so it's, it's, it's extremely important. It's extremely important. Appreciate all yeah. of your help. Thank you. Yeah. I, too, would like to thank you for coming and addressing us this afternoon. Um, I found what you said both interesting and inspiring. Thank you. Um, yeah, particularly in my case because I work on a user experience team and so we're very much focused on how to make things work better for all kinds of people. Um, I started at Microsoft back in the Windows 2.0 days oh. and I remember very clearly how much it came as a shock to us to learn 
that people with visual disabilities loathed us because Windows had disrupted their ability to use computers so much. Um, and I was wondering if you see any emerging technologies that might prove to be as equally disruptive for people with both visual and other disabilities um, that we should be watching out for. You should not, so I, I, I appreciate the question, but you're asking the wrong person. You, you should be asking your colleagues, and those colleagues should have disabilities. So that's the, that's the single best way you get the right answer to that question, because I don't know, nor do you want me to know, right? Because if I know, it means Amazon knows, right? So you don't want me to know what technologies you guys are about to come out with. It's, but when you bring it out, it's too late. It's not too late, but like it's late, right? Mm -hmm. so, so you want your trade secrets to remain your trade secrets. You want your... Um, you know, your uh, project, you know, names, you know, t uh, like secret names to remain secret, y you know, and y you want to do what you're doing, um, and, but you want to have the, the, the depth, the bench depth of people with all different abilities so that those questions are being asked. And again, not just in the set, not just because you want to figure out, well, you know, we're developing, you know, we want to connect YouTube to the Google Home so that like, there can be whatever, right? Like whatever new thing you guys are going to do. Like, not just like, well, how do we make sure that people who are blind can do that? But rather, okay, what, what is it about like how a blind person would want to receive that information that would actually be interesting for others? Um, you know, I mean, let me give, I mean, I don't know, this didn't happen this way, but I mean, one thing. I think back to Google search and when Google search came out compared to Yahoo and compared to, you know, AltaVista and, and Lycos and all the other search engines that have gone, you know, the way of the dinosaur. Um, one thing that was unique about Google from a user experience perspective was how stripped down and simple it was. But it's like extremely low. I mean, I mean, it was like, you know, it's like a big deal when Google will like, you know, put like a holiday thing on there because it's like such a bare bones thing. Whereas like, every, you know, whereas like Yahoo, these other things were using search, um, really embedding search into what they hoped would be kind of like a homepage for a bunch of other things. Now, you know, now when you go to Google search, you've got news, mail, YouTube, whatever, but like it's still relatively bare bones, not as much as it used to be, but it still is. Now that's something that like, uh, you know, it didn't happen because a blind person said, like, that makes it easier to navigate. It does make it easier for blind people to navigate, but it also has other, you know, market value for, for, for with respect to non-blind people. So, again, I, I would say that question that you're asking, you should both ask it of people that are your colleagues who then would be well-positioned to answer it. But then you should also ask the complementary question, which is, which alternative user experiences... Um, should we uh, metastasize outside the disability context into a broader use case scenario? Does that make sense? It makes a lot of yeah. sense. Thank you. Yeah. Have you tried VR? Me? Yeah. I'm down. I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> you know, but there's, an there, there's, a, there's a great example of, of, um, of you know, of, of next generation technologies that could, um, that could unite, that could divide, that could rescue, that could disrupt. But in any case, um, you look, people with disabilities already live in realities that, are, that have different sensory dimensions to them. So why anyone would develop kind of an AR, VR platform without having people with sensory disabilities right in the room makes no sense to me. And I think failure to do that, it doesn't mean the end of the world, but I do think it will mean a delay in, in, in getting products to, and solutions to market. Because there is no doubt that with the technology that Google search, you know, that Google has and had in 2005, 2006, like you all could have done the Echo back then, you know that. You know you could have done Siri back then. I mean, of course you could have. But it was like weird, why would someone who can see ever want to use that kind of thing? So again, I, I think the AR, VR is a great, great use case for, for the proposition that I'm making. So thanks so much for being here today. Um, I don't quite follow your argument about things having been able to be done back then. Um, yep. 
for example, Arthur C. Clarke, Isaac Asimov, these concepts of robot units that can answer your question offhand have been available for a very long time. So I'm not following what and they were thought of, in some cases, by people who were trying to envision what the world would be like by others who couldn't work that way. Um, you know, various... Right, but they were never... Right, but it costs money to take it from, like, the, like, you know, from, like, a Las Vegas expo, and even more so from, a like, you know, the pages of a science fiction book or a futurist, you know, TED Talk. It takes money to get it from there to something that you can hold in your hands. So yes, it's not like the idea of Alexa or Cortana or G Google Home or Siri. Um, it's not like any of these were like not thought of before, right? I mean, look, the, the Internet of Things, the, the smart home, like you guys remember, you could walk into, you could go to Redmond, and they had one in like '98. So they knew it, right? But so much of the like. I think the technology that ended up making it possible and desirable were ones that like you'd have to be sensory deprived to think were innovative. Like, like why isn't there a screen? Because everyone's idea was like the best way to get information is from a screen. The best way to input information is with your hands. And so you'll do it with keystrokes, but no, that's that's you know a moving part. Oh, no, you know, then you go to a mouse. No, you know, okay, that's object oriented. Okay, that's an improvement, but it's still a moving part. How about a touch screen? Okay, but you're still using your hands. So the idea that you would use your mouth to, to, to input information was like, it wasn't that they hadn't thought of it. Of course, every, people had thought of it, like, but it was not desirable enough. It wasn't viewed as marketable because it was like, well, who's doing that? Like, just like some paraplegic, like who, who, who can't use their hands to like use a touch card? It's like the easiest thing ever. So that's my point. It's not a lack of, um, it's not a lack, I think, of, of technological imagination. I think it's a lack of business case imagination. Thanks. But I want, I want people to push, like, disagree with me because it's like nothing's more offensive to me than when people come in and tell me how the legislative process works. So I'm sure it's like some of you find it really irritating <laughs> that this know-it-all was like, you know, took my last math class in 12th grade is like telling you guys like what you could or couldn't have done or whatever, or like what you're interested in. It's like, tell me that I'm wrong. <laughs> All right. I'm only asking this question because nobody else is up here. All right. Ever since I saw your first campaign sign after I moved to this area, I have a really good friend from um, grad school who has a son named Cyrus. And when we looked at the sign, I looked to my wife and I said, do you think he pronounces it Cyrus or Cyrus? Because his, cause my friend who has the kid named Cyrus is a Farsi name or a Persian name. Right. Um, and so now you're here, so now I want to ask you so I can settle this with my wife. <laughs> um, I would say it depends on which language I'm speaking. Okay. Right, so if I'm speaking Farsi, then you would say Sirus, um, you know, and, and if you're, you know, if I'm speaking, like, if I'm speaking English, I would say Cyrus, because that's, that's the English language pronunciation, you know, just like if, you know, if you're speaking um, Spanish, you would say Mexico, if right. you're speaking English, you'd say Mexico, and from my perspective, you know, that's okay. I mean, it's okay to use either one. It's okay to use both. We were just curious. Uh, so, uh, yeah. I don't, yeah, there's yeah. no right answer. No, just... no, that's, that's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'll tell you, like, like Miley Cyrus was like a big help because it's, it's, it's more that, the thing is, it's, it's, it's more that, like, you want people to know how to spell it when they hear it. That's a bigger problem than knowing how to say it when they read it. Right, so the, the problem that, that I want to solve for is like, you know, when I say like, email me at cyrush at gmail.com, right? Like, S-I-R, right, whatever, right? <laughs> so if I said Cirrus, like that would just really throw people off, right? Um, so so I, I like to, um, to, to build off of the kind of name equity, if not necessarily brand equity, <laughs> that Miley Cyrus has built. In, in, in pronouncing pronouncing that name, so um, it is the case that like Cyrus and and the, this kind of similarly sibilant name Sil Silas, 
You like how I did that right there? It's very meta what I did right there. <laughs> Similarly sibilant names, Silas, tend to be the names of like villains in a lot of movies. So just think about it. Um, are there any other questions? No other questions? OK, I'll be around. Um, I, I think we'll, we'll be around for a couple more minutes, and then um, I'm heading out. Um, you know where to find me on social media. Uh, and now you know how to pronounce, uh, you know how to spell at Cyrus Habib or at WALTGov um, on Twitter and on Facebook, et cetera. So um, look forward to uh, being in touch with anybody who wants to talk about these things. And uh, in closing, uh, I will just say that the single best thing that anyone can do here um, above and beyond the, the, the substantive engineering work that you're doing is to help to build a culture, an HR culture, um, that will allow there to be, because you really don't need, there's nothing about the job of lieutenant governor that, that says that I need to come in and give you know, uh, tech companies uh, ideas on how to you know, uh, build products. The best thing is to hire people with, with all different sorts of personal stories and experiences and, and abilities to, in, to, into the company um, to enrich and enliven the, the user base right here and to help you all imagine what the future can look like. Thank you so much.